Today, however, my topic is quite different. I'm going to talk about uh, what physics will be like in 100 years. Now, of course, I don't know what physics will be like in 100 years, but it's fun to think about. Uh, it, you may think it's quite presumptuous to, get, to give a talk like this, and in fact it is, but I'd like, to, like you to know that it's actually quite humble because the origin of this talk is that uh, Brown University is having its 250th anniversary, or actually this has now happened, and they asked me to talk about what physics is going to be like in 250 years. <laughs> so I uh, thought about that <laughs> for a bit and realized that the closest approximation to uh, a treatment of that subject that was reasonably successful was Isaac Newton's uh, queries at the end of his optics where he laid out the agenda for what physics might be like in the future. Uh, and looking back on that, he didn't say how long it was going to take, but looking back on that, uh, by the end of a hundred years, his queries were either being answered or seemed obsolete. So even a genius of the stature of Newton uh, couldn't really see more than a hundred years ahead. Uh, and so I modestly pared back <laughs> from 250 years to 100 years, a nice round number. Uh, it's humbling to think that if you look back a hundred years from today, uh, general relativity was just being invented. Uh, quantum mechanics was in its early days. Uh, the idea of the Big Bang, of black holes, of modern quantum mechanics, all those things were unknown, the and uh, the idea of uh, gauge symmetries that could control the world, the modern standard model or core theory, none of that was even remotely thinkable a hundred years ago. And so thinking a hundred years into the future is a dangerous endeavor. On the other hand, it's interesting to notice that if you uh, look back 50 years, it's not so bad. 50 years from now, most, from, from 50 years ago, a lot of the revolutions I mentioned were already well underway. Uh, the Big Bang had just been discovered. <laughs> uh, quantum mechanics was already mature. Uh, the ideas of the standard model weren't quite there, but the, the, um, it was close, coming. And if you think 25 years back, actually, a physicist waking up from a 25-year sleep, uh, I think would only need a few weeks to catch up to the frontiers <laughs> of what's going on today. <laughs> so, uh, so there is some, uh, there is some, uh, int uh, it's not completely unrealistic to think about physics in 100 years. In any case, it's fun, it's mind-stretching, and I hope you'll indulge me for the next uh, 45 minutes or so as we s speculate about physics in 100 years. Uh, this talk will have two main parts. One is about unifications, which is a grand theme, a great tradition in physics. Uh, the other part will be about uh, future technologies that are informed by fundamental understanding in physics. So once when I was giving a public lecture, uh, I was asked after extolling the glories of uh, possible unification, uh, a question that made me, th that took me aback and then made me think, well, uh, why do physicists care about unification? Isn't it just enough to describe th how things are? And there are two answers to that, which one is that in the past, uh, thinking about unification of different phenomena has even if the phenomena separately were fairly well understood, has turned out to be enormously fruitful and led to uh, surprising new consequences. Uh, a classic example of that is Maxwell's synthesis of electricity and magnetism, which gave birth to uh, electromagnetism, the, the idea of electromagnetic waves unified with optics and uh, uh, led to a lot of the advances in modern physics and technology. Another example that I like to think of because in a sense it was even more gratuitous, even less forced by 
uh, experimental developments is uh, William, Sir William, Ham uh, William Rowan Hamilton in the early 19th century, uh, just for the fun of it, just for the elegance of it, uh, unified geometric optics with mechanics, got a unified this description of how those might work together, and uh, developed the Hamiltonian. And many years later, uh, that turned out to be uh, very close to ideas of wave particle duality and an essential tool in developing quantum theory. So, unification uh, is a great thing. It's also the other example, the other thing to say about it, besides that it has been fruitful in the past and has a glorious history, is that it's just pretty and it leads to uh, uh, a better understanding of, the, a more satisfactory understanding of the world when you have a few concepts governing a lot rather than uh, disconnected concepts. So, uh, Without further ado, let me describe three uh, important unifications that I think are underway or on the horizon. Oh, I'm sorry, so this was out of order. So here are the success stories. There are more, but this is a partial list of success stories where unification of different areas turned out to be enormously fruitful beyond what might have been anticipated from uh, the separate disciplines. And isn't it pretty to think so? <laughs> okay, our current best understanding of matter uh, is based on uh, separate theories uh, for electric, weak, and strong forces, and also gravity. Uh, that are only loosely connected, but are based on very similar principles. They're all based on generalizations of the Maxwell equations, uh, the Yang-Mills equations, uh, that support enormous amounts of symmetry, and of course the principles of quantum mechanics. If you write them down, they all have a strong family resemblance. And so uh, it's suggested, because of that, that maybe they are all aspects of one underlying uh, force that relies on the same principles but has different aspects. Uh, two special features of uh, our understanding of the standard model or our core theories uh, encourage this kind of idea. One is the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking which shows that you can have a theory with high symmetry, so symmetry that could unify uh, different forces, uh, where the equations have this high symmetry, but their realization in the world has less, because all the stable realizations of the equations have less symmetry than the equations themselves. So we say the symmetry is spontaneously broken. And our current theory of uh, electric and weak interactions, the so-called electroweak theory, <laughs> builds that idea in from the very beginning. It's uh, a necessary part of uh, our theories of those forces. And it was dramatic, its basic idea was dramatically confirmed in recent years when the Higgs particle, which was a necessary ingredient to making this kind of instability of the equations, uh, was actually discovered. Uh, the other <coughs> principle, so uh, if we imagine a super duper Higgs mechanism, we could imagine that all the three symmetries of electric, weak, and strong interactions based on U1, SU2, and SU3 gauge groups, that all of them could be manifestations of spontaneous breaking of some underlying larger symmetry. Uh, the other idea that uh, allows that to possibly be, to, to be implemented and allows quantitative study of the idea of, of that possibility is asymptotic freedom which has been alluded to, uh, the idea or the fact that uh, the effective strength of different kinds of, uh, of your basic interaction changes depending on at what distance or at what energy uh, you measure it. In uh, quantum mechanics, uh, uh, when you neglect 
uh, ma the effect of masses, and if we go extrapolate to very high energies, masses become irrelevant. Uh, these are dual concepts, and so simplicity or evolution of this coupling at short distance uh, also is equivalent to and implies uh, evo uh, the similar evolution as you study processes at higher and higher energy. Uh, now, if the underlying equations have a larger symmetry than the separate interactions based on separate gauge symmetries, SU3, SU2, and, and U1, then uh, by the principles of symmetry, they should all have equal strength. But as we observe them, they don't. However, if the symmetry is spontaneously, we entertain the hypothesis that the symmetry is spontaneously broken at a short distance, so, uh, or uh, by condensates similar to the Higgs condensate in the electroweak interaction, which spoils the symmetry when you look at, it, at uh, its effects at, low, at energies whose uh, <coughs> magnitude is less than the value of the, of the condensate. Uh, then we can entertain the hypothesis that a similar thing works on a grand scale, that uh, originally there was symmetry between these guys and the couplings were equal, but uh, the condensate comes in and spoils the equality, and to reconstruct that equality, we have to run the coupling constants back up to high energy and see what the basic interactions would look like if we strip away the uh, uh, complications due to the structure of, 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 of the vacuum, due to the spontaneous symmetry breaking and the uh, vacuum polarization, technically. So this is a kind of calculation one knows how to do. Nobel Prizes have been awarded for it, so it must be right. And uh, if you couple, if you plot the inverse coupling strength versus logarithm of the energy, then to a good approximation, the evolution looks like straight lines. And if you know what kind of particles contribute to the vacuum polarization, you can calculate the slope of those lines. And if you make the correction to see how the couplings evolve, make the corrections due to vacuum polarization for all the known couplings, you see that the hypothesis that they unify almost but not quite works. Almost but not quite. The width of these lines indicates the experimental uncertainty uh, and, and theoretical uncertainties. Uh, we start at relatively modest energies here. This, so this is something like the LHC. And uh, extrapolate boldly to much shorter distances or higher energies. Uh, and it almost but not quite works. So how are we supposed to react to this? Well, the uh, famous philosopher Karl Popper taught that the goal of science was to produce falsifiable theories. And here we've produced a theory that's not only falsifiable, but actually false. So what could be better? We've done our job. But of course, that's not the way we approach things. If we have beautiful ideas that seem promising, <laughs> and especially if we have the prospects of unity, uh, we should not give up easily. And these guys seem to be wanting to do the right thing. They're just a little bit off. So they're, uh, diff uh, the different strengths are approaching each other. They just never come to a common focus. So uh, maybe we've left out something. Maybe we should be even more ambitious. And a, an extension, a bigger unification that you might add to the unification of the different forces uh, would be to unify the forces and substances. Uh, the unification of the different forces I mentioned uh, would unify all the different strong uh, color gluons, the W and Z bosons of the weak interaction, and the photon of, this, of electromagnetism, all into a common description in one, as all being carriers of one larger gauge force. Uh, 
And it would, to a very remarkable extent, unite the quarks and leptons of different <laughs> kinds, the different kinds of matter particles, into one common multiplet. For experts, one representations of the unification group, if, if you do SO10 unification. Uh, but it would still leave us with two things, force on the one hand, substance on the other. An idea called supersymmetry, which sort of goes one step beyond wave-particle unification. Let me backtrack a little bit. Wave-particle unification <laughs> already blurs the distinction between force and substance. We think of substance as particles, forces as mediated by waves, as in uh, photons and Maxwell theory. Uh, but leaves us, but, but that, that, that applies to single particles, uh, and indeed, uh, electrons, single electrons behave a lot like single photons. They both can be described as either waves or particles. But when you go to two electrons or two photons, it's quite different. Uh, photons are bosons, so they very, they happily involve, uh, 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 they happily occupy the same quantum state. In fact, they want to. And so in a laser, it's easy to get photons to all act in the same way. Whereas electrons resolutely refuse to uh, occupy the same quantum state. They obey the Pauli exclusion principle. Uh, and so that's responsible for the hardness of matter that the electrons in different don't want to go through each other, don't want to occupy the same space. Or the, this, the fact that white dwarfs can support themselves against gravity. These are effects of electrons. Uh, not wanting to occupy the same state, they are fermions. So, 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 so when you go to two particles, even though the one particle behavior is quite similar, uh, when you go to two particles, they're quite different. Uh, the unification uh, of those two very, very different kinds of uh, uh, aspects of reality, substance on the one hand and force on the other, is a very non-trivial thing. It was not known how to achieve anything like that until the early 1970s, when Wes and Zumino uh, discovered something called supersymmetry. Supersymmetry is a possible symmetry of the equations that govern nature that allow one in the equations to interchange force and substance, interchange bosons and fermions technically, uh, leaving the content of the equations unchanged. So that's a symmetry, even though uh, you change very different kinds of particles one into the other. The, so the equations look quite different. Uh, their consequences are the same. And that uh, uh, would be a ultimate unification, including not only unifying the different forces and unifying the different substances, but also unifying force and substance together. Uh, to do that, however, we need to modify the equations. We have to include a lot more particles to make equations that have this symmetry. By the way, it's got to be, of course, a spontaneously broken symmetry again, because the world does not exhibit uh, uh, the particles in th that we actually observe don't exhibit this uh, possibility of changing bosons into fermions without changing the mass of the particles. So you have to break the symmetry. but uh, if you include the particles necessary to implement them and give them a relatively modest mass, you s then they are effects as uh, corrections to uh, evolution of the couplings. Their, correct, their effects in vacuum polarization can be calculated and make a significant change to the calculation I showed you that almost but not quite worked. And if you do it uh, quantitatively, you find that now they do accurately come together. It's quite stunning. <coughs> uh, and as a bonus, gravity so far has been left out of this discussion, uh, but uh, we can apply the same sort of consideration to considering how gravity uh, behaves at very, very high energy. Gravity notoriously at low energies is much, much weaker than the other forces. If I plotted it on this graph, it would be way outside the known universe. 
so uh, it doesn't appear actually on this transparency. It's out there somewhere. But if, then I, if I continue the calculation, because the evolution, uh, the dependence on energy is not uh, logarithmic as it is for this running of couplings due to vacuum polarization, but directly depends on the square of the energy, it's much more dramatic, and gravity unifies with the other ones pretty nearly too. So this is a bonus. These calculations were all done based on just low energy in information about these separate interactions, but it solves a notorious problem, potentially, of why the strength of gravity is so different from the strength of the other forces, just as a bonus. So that's why I love Susie. And I firmly believe that this is going to be a uh, component of physics in 100 years. The coincidence is too great for that to be a coincidence. Uh, a, an exciting prospect is that it may not take so long as 100 years. Experiments at the LHC are opening windows that possibly will lead to the discovery of supersymmetric particles, the extra particles we had to include to make symmetry, supersymmetry of our equations uh, already uh, might be evident at uh, the LHC. We can hope. Uh, this would be a very satisfactory development in our understanding of nature. At present, we have two different things, forces and substances, very reminiscent of the Chinese uh, duality of yang, force, and uh, yin, substance, and supersymmetry would show us that you can flip that upside down and uh, interchange one with the other and still have uh, show uh, still have uh, a valid description of the world. So each would show, so the, uh, the existence of each of uh, both would be necessary, uh, uh, a necessary implication of the existence of the other. A second grand unification that's occurring today, but uh, has a long, uh, where we can expect uh, much more over the next hundred years is the unification of the small and the large. This is a famous picture of the anisotropies. This is what the microwave, the, the sky looks like in microwaves. Well, not quite. Uh, this is what the sky would look like if you filtered out the average value of the microwave background which is very accurately uniform, and then turned up the contrast by a factor of 10,000. Uh, so these are part in 10,000 anisotropies in the energy of the microwave sky. This is ascribed to tiny <laughs> seed fluctuations uh, at the time of uh, uh, when uh, photons began to propagate freely, liberated from the dense early plasma of the uh, Big Bang. And if, so this is carrying information from the early history of the universe to, to us and tells us that the universe started out much, much more homogeneous, but had tiny fluctuations that uh, later uh, grew by gravitational instability into galaxies, stars, and the other structures we observe today. Uh, and there's a more or less plausible astrophysical history for how that all happened, given these fluctuations. But where did the fluctuations come from? Well, there's a glorious theory of that, uh, based on the idea that those fluctuations are also vacuum polarization. That, that what you're seeing there is a magnified version, magnified by a process of cosmic expansion at a rapid rate, sometimes called inflation, whoops, uh, of the fluctuations that we know are happening everywhere and all the time in space and time due to the basic nature of quantum mechanics. What you see here is the fluctuations that are calculated in the energy density of gluon fields, 
if your eyes could resolve uh, distances of 10 to the minus 14 centimeters and times of order 10 to the minus 24 seconds, this is the kind of thing you would see. Uh, we can say that with some confidence because uh, the equations, that, I mean the calculations that give this kind of picture of the dynamics of what's happening uh, have many other consequences we can check, uh, including the vacuum polarization I showed you before and the confinement of quarks. This is actually, of course, since you don't see it, there's some artistic creativity involved <laughs> in, in uh, conveying what you would see if your eyes were different from what they are. But what you see here is just uh, the distribution in energy of gluon fields as it fluctuates due to spontaneous activity in the vacuum, zero point motion or vacuum polarization uh, or virtual particles. They're all names for the same thing. Uh, where you see these hot colors, that's where the de energy density is the largest. And then you see cooler colors where it's small, smaller. And of course, there's a cutoff applied uh, where you leave things empty. That's not because there's no fluctuations, but because you, you apply a cutoff. It's necessary to do that in order to make the whole thing visible. Otherwise, it would just be a haze. <laughs> so uh, it's an amazing possibility that these fluctuations could be the same <coughs> as these fluctuations. Uh, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that points in that direction, but at present we don't know what it is that's doing the fluctuation. We have a name for it, it's the inflaton, but it's not closely integrated into our th fundamental theories of nature. Uh, we don't know, it's certainly not the gluon fields that are depicted here, but it might be some other field that appears in unified theories. Uh, and it's a great goal of physics over the next hundred years to put flesh on the bones of these speculations and nail down what it is that's doing the fluctuation if this is the right picture. There are other mysteries about uh, the connection between the uh, large and the small that are very promising and I think, I certainly hope, will be resolved over the next hundred years. Uh, one outstanding mystery is the nature of the dark matter that astronomers have identified for us. There seems to be uh, a lot, if you view the motion of distant galaxies, uh, there seems to be more uh, acceleration than can be ascribed to the visible kinds of matter, the, matters we, the matter we uh, know and love and are made out of and that we understand very well in our core theories. There's some other kind of thing that uh, is five times as abundant as measured by mass, so we call this the dark matter. Uh, we don't know what it is. Uh, we have candidates, it's probably axions, but the experimental verdict is not yet in. <coughs> and that's an ongoing frontier and I hope, certainly hope in the next hundred years, in fact I hope in the next ten years, we'll know what that dark matter is. And then another unification is uh, understanding what this is. This is a picture of a complicated network of connections. This is what you and I are, uh, fundamentally, we're, uh, we think, as physical objects, we're uh, neurons, uh, our, uh, our memories, our personalities are all somehow, our thoughts are somehow functions of electrical activity in these nets. Uh, how does it work? Nobody knows. So we know what the physical laws are to adequate accuracy, I think, almost certainly, for addressing <laughs> these questions. Uh, the laws of quantum electrodynamics, of quantum chromodynamics, and uh, even if necessary, the weak interactions are, have been tested so accurately and under such extreme conditions that I think it's overwhelmingly plausible that the fundamental equations that govern those neural nets as physical objects are known to sufficient accuracy 
but there's the great challenge of understanding how uh, those basic physical laws give rise to uh, uh, the experience of, uh, of the world that we have and in general to complex phenomena. So uh, let me turn now from the discussion of unifications to the discussions of technologies. Arthur C. Clarke, the uh, science fiction author, famously said that uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. To which I'd like to add uh, an addendum or a scolium, a, con a comment, which is that nature's technology is highly advanced. And I'll let you construct the syllogism. So uh, let me discuss technology on several different scales and in several different contexts. First, making things on the microscopic level. As I mentioned already, uh, we almost certainly know the laws necessary for uh, all practical applications uh, with a very wide definition of what practical means. So specifically, we know the laws, as Dirac already claimed in the 1930s, adequate to describe all of chemistry. So really, physicists should be aiming to put chemists out of business. We should be aiming to replace chemical laboratories by big banks of computers running the equations that we know govern uh, chemistry. That would be much easier, much less smelly, much, <laughs> much more flexible than actually having to, ca to uh, find the substances, refine them, and put them through various indignities to figure out uh, useful designs. This kind of process has happened in aerodynamics. At MIT, you can find uh, vast, uh, enormous wind tunnels that were once used to test airplane components and possible designs of aircraft. Those were marvelous things and uh, 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 not quite as large as the LHC, but pretty darn big. Uh, and marvels of technology in their time and very useful. But now they're not used at all. They're totally abandoned and they've been replaced by things like this. You calculate airline designs, not you don't use wind tunnels anymore. <laughs> uh, and I think in a hundred years we can look forward to the same sort of thing happening for chemistry. Uh, this will allow great flexibility in, discover in uh, uh, considering new materials, great creativity in uh, building uh, in, uh, interesting molecules. So here's an example of something that has been calculated very accurately and uh, has been used to predict properties. The, the electronic structure of s carbon-60 buckyballs, which have a lot of symmetry, so you can actually make a lot of progress solving the equations and get marvelous predictions for how the electrons are distributed and, f and for the behavior. And in general, uh, the structure of graphene, which was uh, a substance that existed theoretically since the 1940s, but was just dis discovered uh, experimentally how to produce it uh, in the 21st century, and uh, quite very quickly uh, got a Nobel Prize, and now is de being developed into technology. We could make a lot of progress very rapidly once the substance was actually produced because it's properties could be calculated theoretically with great confidence. And you can start to dream about making, putting these things, these sheets together uh, in creative ways into making molecular sieves and structures in three dimensions. And that's, that's going ahead. Oh. Uh, Sorry, the animation got kind of mixed up, but this is the head of, of a needle, the eye of a needle, you see. And featured there is a skateboarder. 
So the future is, is coming <laughs> where you can uh, make these molecular designs and uh, a micro world of uh, useful devices that uh, will be really, really small. At present, three-dimension uh, computers and microelectronics, as impressive as it is, is based on things that are two-dimensional, fundamentally, chips that are, if you've seen them laid out, they're two-dimensional. They're easily damaged. They have to be produced at special, in special clean rooms and in very special uh, facilities that cost billions of dollars to uh, uh, fund. And if, uh, if they're damaged, they don't repair themselves. If you, you can ruin your computer by putting it in a strong magnetic field or by dropping it really hard. Uh, none of those are fundamental uh, limitations. And in fact, none of those are properties of biological systems that do computations. So uh, we can look forward to uh, future technologies where computers are three-dimensional, fault-tolerant, and self-repairing. And not only computers, but machines in general that are self-assembling and self-replicating. This is leads into uh, interesting possibilities for macroscopic uh, uh, engineering. If you can build things that are self-replicating, you can have exponential growth and think about really, really large structures. Uh, at present, our, technolo our technology is getting us into trouble with different limitations from pollution, uh, not enough energy to go around with an expanding human population and uh, increasing living standards. Uh, a vision of science fiction writers and famously uh, propounded also by uh, Freeman Dyson is the idea of the Dyson sphere where you would surround a whole star by energy gathering devices that would capture all its energy. At present on Earth Human energy consumption, as large as it is and as troublesome as it's been, is about one, four, one part in 40,000 of the energy that's raining down on us all the time from the sun. So there's a lot that's left on the table. Uh, I don't think we'll <laughs> achieve the Dyson sphere within 100 years, but we will uh, necessarily, and I think that we'll, we're on the way to, uh, gathering much more of the sun's energy and running the world on fusion power, namely the fusion energy of the sun. And the technologies that I mentioned in the micro world, uh, making things three-dimensional, new kinds of architectures that are three-dimensional, fault tolerant, and self-repairing will enable the kinds of visions that uh, uh, Olaf Stapleton and other science fiction writers pioneered the idea of turning whole brains, whole planets, or at least mountains or asteroids into gigantic brains. Another possibility that uh, I find entrancing and I myself have been working on is the possibility of enhancing the human sens sensorium. It's kind of humiliating to human vanity to consider our vision relative to the vision of the mantis shrimp. Our vision is trichromatic. We, it's limited to this uh, uh, small band of electromagnetic radiation, even though there's a lot more out there. And even within that band, we take only three averages to get uh, our color vision. But the, in principle, there's a whole continuum of energy out there, and it's, it's telling, it encodes information about the properties of substances and objects that are very useful, uh, potentially. Uh, in fact, there are creatures, 
in particular, the champion of the animal world is apparently this humble mantis shrimp. It occurs in various varieties. It's a very successful species, as you might imagine. Uh, <laughs> the uh, varieties have between, instead of three, between 12 and 16 different kinds of receptors that also extend into the ultraviolet and into the infrared. Uh, we shouldn't be satisfied <laughs> with, uh, uh, given all the resources of modern technology and the fact that we understand that there's more information out there to get uh, with the three receptors. We should think about ways of getting some more. Now, there are lots of tricks with modern technology that could enable this, but let me just give you a taste of it very simply <coughs> with something that doesn't require new technology but just uh, uh, a little bit of trickery in using existing technology. So this is the famous Nishihara test for color blindness. Mm -hmm. The most common kind of color blindness is so-called red-green color blindness. Uh, it can be simulated pretty effectively by uh, taking an RGB display, like on this computer, and simply setting R and G both equal to R plus G divided by 2. Then the difference between red and green is obliterated and uh, this picture turns into this one. <coughs> and you can see the basis of the Nisha and, and uh, this is a pretty good simulation, uh, although not perfect, of uh, uh, red-green color blindness in the sense that uh, people who have red-green color blindness will not be able to tell the difference between these two pictures or in general between pictures that you apply this process of replacing R and G by their average too. So uh, the point of the test is that normal vision people will see an 8 here and colorblind people will see nothing because it'll look like the same thing. So. Instead of three-dimensional vision, instead of three receptors, they have two, roughly speaking. You can restore that information, though, with a simple trick. A simple trick is uh, to put in time-dependent modulation that restores the information, opening up a new channel, and when you do that, the extra information that distinguishes the eight leaps right out. So this is a very simple example but of a much wider idea that you can restore the potential extra information that's in the electromagnetic spectrum and uh, allow humans to see some of the things that mantis shrimps do by uh, technological tricks. Ramified mines, that is mines that extend in and branch out in directions, I think, uh, is already happening in the sense. Uh, the younger people in the audience will think nothing of what to the older of us seems like a miracle. Uh, <coughs> the possibility of having Skype conversations all over the world <laughs> with people and seeing them and interacting with them in real time. Uh, this is, if you think about it, a distributed, uh, a distributed sensor, a spatially expanding sensorium. We can sense what's happening in China immediately. We can sense what's happening elsewhere. Uh, this is still in its early days, dramatic as it is. One can certainly imagine uh, uh, richer feedback from, from distant places happening all the time, and so you'd have an enriched spatial sensorium with distant sensors. Uh, if you're part of your family lives on the west coast and part on the east coast in the United States, you could be in both places at once, in effect, if you have uh, very good uh, communications. You could be experiencing what's going on in both places. Uh, distributed intelligence, of course, is another uh, easier, even more common thing, but we take for granted that 
we can gather information from all over the world on the internet. Th that information is, is, is available to us. Uh, a frontier that's only beginning, but I think in a hundred years will be on a par with the others, is expanding fields of action. You don't just have, can imagine having not just sensors in different places, but also actuators that allow you to do things in other places. Uh, this, I think, is likely to be the future of space travel, these kinds of ideas. Putting humans in space is very, very difficult. We're not, our bodies are not meant to go there. They're not designed for it. Uh, if you've seen the picture of the Martian, which, uh, you see an idealized version <laughs> of the difficulties of uh, survival on Mars. Actually, it's much more difficult. And, uh, <laughs> We can do many of the same things, I think, uh, with our minds and, and technology without uh, hauling our bodies all over space. A fascinating possibility is quantum minds, quantum computers. Uh, these are currently on the drawing board, computers that use the full resources of quantum mechanics in a way that present computers don't. Present computers have a state at any one time that's described by lots of ones and zeros. And the operation of the computer at a very high level of abstraction is just to go from one state of ones and zeros to another state by, by a program, and that can represent information. But in quantum mechanics, states are not just single arrays of ones and zeros, but amplitudes for potentially many, many states of ones and zeros all at once. So you can do information processing in many, many channels at once by operating on these wave functions. Now, at present, uh, quantum computers are in a primitive state. They are used for things like factoring the number 15 in interesting ways. Uh, but the potential, the physical potential is there for doing new kinds of computations, and uh, uh, there are problems known for which quantum computers are more efficient than uh, classical computers. Among those problems are problems of cryptography. So uh, agencies like the National Security Agency are very, very interested in quantum computers, which means it gets funded, which means it will develop over the next hundred years. And uh, I think by the end of 100 years, uh, very likely we'll have very capable quantum computers and we'll start to think about quantum AI. <coughs> and these will be new kinds of intelligence that are truly, mind, uh, truly alien, truly mind-boggling. They will have capabilities like, because they can be in several states with different amplitudes all at once, those states can be contradictory they can have quite different properties, and these minds will have them both embodied at once and interacting with each other. Uh, the Schrodinger cat will be both will, it, will be both alive and the dead, and, 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 uh, and also because uh, quantum evolution is unitary, it can be run both forwards and backwards if you have access to the circuits. Uh, there are interesting possibilities for manipulating time. Uh, quantum mind will be quite an interesting uh, thing to think about in quantum AI. <coughs> so, uh, I hope I've uh, showed you that physics has uh, a glorious future, both in terms of uh, reaching new levels of basic understanding in unification, but also in exploiting the things we already know in creative ways to make new technologies that are uh, uh, like magic, truly. Okay, so thank you, and I hope we can have some questions and discussion. <laughs>